Our next speaker is Professor Kathy Kasich, and she is a documentary filmmaker and an assistant professor at California State University in Sacramento. Her work has screened all over the place at the international festivals and museums and broadcast on television, including the BBC, Discovery, Smithsonian, the PBS, National Geographic, and I'll stop there. Before CSUS, she taught for six years at Montana State University in the Science and Natural History Filmmaking Graduate Program. She founded MSU's Center for the Communication of Science. Kathy is currently the Education and Outreach Director of an NSF-funded exploration of an Antarctic subglacial lake that exists 1,100 meters beneath the ice. I think we'll hear more about that. So please welcome Professor Kathy Kasich. Okay, thank you so much. Wow, um, I just want to say I'm so humbled uh, to be here amongst all of you and uh, following Senator Allen is no easy task, but it's amazing all the work that he's been doing and, um, and that all of you are doing. I'm so excited to hear more about that because everybody I've met so far has been incredibly interesting. So, um, so I feel like I'm in really good company, so thank you. Um, okay, so um, if we could have some pictures. <laughs> I'm a filmmaker um, and uh, I can't do without imagery. <laughs> so um, I'm, a, I'm a scientist as well um, who about 16 years ago became a filmmaker. Um, and I typically work at the intersection of art and science. So tonight I'm going to share, um, as Will said, one of my projects um, that I've been involved in for the last four years as it relates to environmental literacy um, based in Antarctica. There it is. Um, so despite its seclusion at the bottom of the Earth, uh, Antarctica has a daily effect on us through its uh, climate and ocean systems. And its ice holds secrets to a past long frozen in time before our recorded history. So this ice is also a large reservoir, as we know, that when it melts will cause the sea level to rise. So what happens in Antarctica today has the potential to greatly influence our existence in the future. So understanding how that ice has changed in the past is of critical importance for how we might anticipate the future effects of climate change on our planet. So what you may not realize is that underneath the ice sheet, there are about over 400 subglacial lakes. Uh, and rivers and streams, a whole system, a whole ecosystem hidden under there. Um, and that ice sheet is actually moving at a half a meter uh, a day. So this subglacial environment, though, has been so scarcely explored that we actually know more about the surface of Mars. I think this is too high, sorry. Um, anyway, so the, one of the best ways to understand um, the past melting is to look at this subglacial environment. Um, and then also, by looking into the subglacial environment, there's another side, uh, well not side, but an important research aspect, which is to understand how life itself evolved. And that can tell us a lot about our own existence. So it was these ideas that unified a very diverse, um, sorry, interdisciplinary group of scientists to study one of these lakes, um, known as Lake Mercer, which is uh, that dot over there. And, uh, it's about 300 miles from the South Pole. So for the last uh, four years, I've been involved in that project. It's called SALSA, Subglacial Antarctic Lakes Scientific Access. And the work is, is part of a study that um, you know, incorporates climate change and evolution, two, uh, two concepts that have basically been banned in various times. Okay, so um, environmental literacy relies on understanding how places like Antarctica might affect us thousands of miles away, the interrelated complex nature of our planet. If we're going to solve the problems of climate change and environmental degradation, it'll be through a populace that understands and cares about these complexities. Environmental scholar Andrew Hoffman writes, the Anthropocene era represents an emergent awareness of a fundamental change in the intellectual, cultural, and psychological conceptions of who we are as humans 
what is the world around us, and how the two are intertwined. In effect, it's a change in our environmental ethic. Perhaps we have ways to relay the information, but change only happens when people care, which is an emotion. So while we must appeal to a cognitive understanding, we also must appeal to an emotional understanding. So the sciences allow us to learn about our world and know about our world. And the arts allow us to experience our world and process how we feel about it. So while there are many ways to improve environmental literacy, in this particular talk tonight, I just want to address the importance of cross-disciplinary, co-creative collaborations between scientists and artists. It's, not gonna take, it's, it's gonna take not only uh, getting young people curious about science, but also facilitating young people to become science-savvy artists. And I don't think we should take lightly the fact that due to the rise of testing and the lack of funding, the arts have virtually disappeared from our public schools. My daughter maybe has one music lesson a month, and, um, and I get her in art classes every week, but otherwise it's once every two weeks. So I'd like to share with you our transmedia approach to education and outreach and a co-creative collaboration between scientists and artists, one which I hope will promote greater knowledge of our larger, large-scale research and promote um, a greater curiosity in its science. Okay, so uh, this is us on the ice. This is our team. Uh, 50, there were 50 of us. It doesn't look like it there. I think some of them were hiding away in, in some tent. Um, so. I am um, I'm the Education and Outreach Director of uh, SALSA. Uh, we were funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, this is about 300 miles from the South Pole, um, and it was there that we drilled a hole in the ice um, 3,600 feet down. Um, and um, we spent um, about three weeks camping in those tents on the ice, and three more weeks in, um, in McMurdo. So um, it's important to note that the drill we used is actually a hot water drill, so there were no chemicals involved. It was just like basically taking a, an enormous garden hose and um, filling it with hot water and um, melting the ice, which then closed up very quickly afterwards. Okay, so, so this lake's known as Lake Mercer. I think I might have said that already. Um, and it actually hadn't seen the light of day for over 100,000 years, we think. Um, and it was the second lake that's ever been explored. Um, and the first, the deepest one we've ever explored. So uh, I, I spent my time um, taking photos and making films uh, alongside our um, former, I say former because he's graduated, uh, graduate student, Billy Collins, who's actually sitting right there. Can you give a wave? <laughs> Integral part of the whole thing. Um, and a science savvy artist, I'd say. Okay, in, um, in researching the film work we would do on this project, I came across a silent film from 1924 um, called The Great White Silence by Herbert Ponting. And it was actually about Robert Scott's fateful journey to the South Pole, where he died walking back um, after having just been beaten by a Norwegian Amundsen. And um, anyway, they, one, of the, one of the titles um, in there says, the Antarctic continent is an ice-clad wilderness of dazzling whiteness and appalling silence. It is the home of nature in her most savage and merciless moods, and is there that the hurricane and the blizzard are born. <laughs> and um, I think it's, well, interesting that Robert Scott said, my God, what an awful place. <laughs> So even in Scott's day, they understood that capturing the visual reality of an Antarctica would create a lasting impression on the populace. And indeed, whether it's due to their writings or the films, um, it's definitely made an indelible mark on the heroic age of exploration in Antarctica. Um, anyway, so underneath this ice sheet, there's quite a lot going on. Um, this is the West Antarctic ice sheet um, in that corner there. It's relatively unstable. According to the National Snow and Ice Data Center, models of its behavior indicate a potential for catastrophic accelerated ice loss as climate change continues to push the system towards thinning, faster flow, and retreat. A complete collapse would raise global sea level by 14 feet, 
not to alarm you too much, but sea level on the whole is predicted to rise by two to three and a half feet by 2100. So, you know, as long as it stays put, you know, not 14 feet at least. Um, so the uh, John Mercer actually is the first um, one who suggested that potentially the West Antarctic ice sheet could collapse according um, through greenhouse um, gas. And um, indeed, um, that was about 1978, and people didn't believe him. You know, it went kind of under the radar for a long time. And um, he thought that the, the, there would be a rapid deglaciation. He was a glaciologist. And of course, the namesake of our lake, right? Um, and we are seeing that his predictions are coming true. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about why that is later. It has to do with the structure of the continent underneath the ice sheet. Actually, you'll see it in a film. Right? Um, so, so it's important for us to understand the dynamics of the West Antarctic ice sheet so we can understand how, it, how did it melt in the past and can we understand the conditions that might cause it to melt in the future. Um, and so we're doing that through looking at the sedimentary record because just like fossils, you know, it, it'll tell you a history. So the results of, um, of this are going to lead to understanding the evolution of the Antarctic ice sheet as it relates to climate change, but also um, improve our knowledge of subglacial ecosystems and their microbial habitat and makeup, and provide insight into how life could possibly survive in icy moons and planets in our uh, solar system and beyond. OK, but so getting all that information to the public is my task. OK, so but one problem remains. Um, with all the information at our fingertips, getting information out there is difficult enough, and then added to which uh, there's a public distrust of science. So education and outreach, then, my goal is to integrate the arts with the science to create an environmental literacy and restore trust in science through following this human aspect of the exploration in multiple platforms. Uh, and so that means that we had this transmedia approach, which um, we have a variety of films. We have, we've completed three short films so far, um, and I'll show you one of those tonight. And we're also working on a feature-length documentary about the exploration, I'll show you a trailer from that as well. And, um, and then we're doing outreach to schools. We've got uh, a museum installation at um, Scripps Aquarium, at the Birch Aquarium. And we've got uh, PBS Learning Media modules that we're working on, and I'll talk about those in a bit. And a social media campaign, and uh, of course a website with uh, field blogs that we, we um, actually managed to do. I say that because it was very difficult to upload anything when you have no internet. Um, basically, we had to take a thumb drive and give it to the pilot who would land the airplane maybe once a week or twice a week. And then that would then get sent to McMurdo Station, who then uh, would, they would upload it to the web very slowly. It took about a day. And so then 10 photos would go to our graduate student at MSU in Montana State, who would then put it on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and so um, anyway, so Billy, integral part. This is Billy again. Um, and we also have other people um, involved. And so Kathy Trainer is the one who I was just talking about in the corner on the right. And um, then we have uh, three other students as well who uh, are in film who have been involved. Okay, so this um, is the poster for Coring for Climate, um, and it's a short science film. I think it'll explain a little bit more about the science, so I'd like to direct you, your attention to these screens so you can watch the film. It's about 13 and a half, 14 minutes.
So one of the things that we're after as geologists studying sediments and ice in Antarctica is to try to figure out how the past changes that occurred before humans were one of the prevalent forces on Earth, how these changes occurred, how fast they occurred, and how frequently they occurred. There always has been climate change. That's a, a well-known fact, and we, we geologists are the ones who've unmasked that. But we're also interested at looking at the human time scale and how the changes that we're observing now in the instrumental record of sea level, of temperature, of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere relates to what we can pull out of ice cores and sediment cores in Antarctica. Antarctica holds many secrets because it's you know, the last really big ice-covered part of the world that can contribute to really big meter level sea level rise. So what we're looking for as geologists is to go back in, in history and see how often, how much, and perhaps why sea level has changed in the past by looking at the sedimentary record as well as the ice core record. I think in order to understand where the ice might go in the future, we have to understand when it got here, how it got here, and then periods of ice advance and retreat. So when you have a continent that's almost completely covered by ice and all that ice has the potential to melt, you certainly want to understand its history. So for me, that's one of the big draws of coming to Antarctica, is that there's so much to learn about a place that really matters. SALSA, which stands for Subglacial Antarctic Lakes Scientific Access, is a pretty unique and interdisciplinary project where we're bringing biologists, geochemists, geologists together to try to tap into this pretty unique environment of a subglacial lake. A subglacial lake is any lake that is underneath a glacier. Under the Antarctic uh, ice sheet, there are hundreds of subglacial lakes. Very few of those have actually been sampled, so uh, we're going to be going out to a lake called Subglacial Lake Mercer um, and drilling through the ice into that lake. Lakes anywhere on Earth are reservoirs of history, right? They're on the bottom of everything. We will learn a lot about the history of Antarctica in terms of when the ice cover was here, when it was not here, and that tells us about past climates. Oh, we're drilling. At least we get down a ways before we, we can, then I don't care if we slow down. This project revolves around a borehole and the borehole is drilled by our, our fantastic drillers. And they're basically using um, melted snow that they're heating up and putting through a shower head that will melt the, the ice and snow around them to make a hole. And they're gonna keep going down, 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 all the way you know, a kil kilometer through the, the ice sheet. And that's what we'll use to access the subglacial lake Mercer. So we're going to enter the borehole with a device called the multi-core first, and that's designed to sample just the interface between the lake water and the sediment. And that weighs about 150 pounds, and it fills three tubes with mud at a time. So when it comes back up, hopefully we'll have three tubes with a good amount of, of mud in them that we can then study that interface with. <laughs> So once we open up the borehole, pretty much the activity is non-stop. And it's like a, a machine or a play where everybody has this role and they know exactly what they need to do. 
and people do that for a day and then a second day and a third day and a fourth day and a fifth day and a sixth day, all, mostly without sleep. Jack got mad. I said three cores, 45 centimeters each. Uh, one is a little shorter. Three cap cores. Woo! Yes. <laughs> um, subsequent to that, we're going to use something that we're calling the borehole jumbo gravity core. And it's going to go down into the borehole. It is about 2,500 pounds um, all put together. And basically, we have to lower the core into the borehole until we get close to the bottom. And then we're gonna send something that we call a messenger down. And the messenger just clips onto the rope and we just you know, let it drop. And it goes zooming down the rope and it's going to smash into something at the, at the bottom of the rope and allows the core to free fall so that we can really punch into the sediments. <sighs> Go devil. Oh, there we go. That worked, baby. That worked. That was, uh, that was two minutes. Woo! Yeah. One point two miles. West Antarctica for over 30 years has been um, anticipated to be the least stable part of the Antarctic ice shelf and that because the ice is grounded below sea level that if we warm the oceans around it and the atmosphere on top of it that we could potentially have catastrophic melting that would then enter the ocean and cause sea level rise. So one of our interests in trying to core deeper into this type of sediment is that as these sediments are deposited in a, in a perfect setting, they would be deposited as if you could imagine a layer cake, one layer built on top of another. And as you move up in those layers, you're getting into younger and younger sediment until you get to the surface, which is more or less present. Let's balance it on the railing. This one's really heavy, guys. Yep. Let's lower this in. Let's lower this in. to yeah. the shoulders. Right. Fun trick. Go tell the guy in front. Do, there we go. What a cut. Oh, wow. Give it some oh, 33. 33? Yeah. 33. Um, it's somewhere between 170 and 180 because there's some empty space here. Okay. Did we win? What was you the... want a pop tart, Amy? Or maybe some Fruit Loops. <laughs> Am I hearing some sarcasm? One thing that's unique about this environment is that West Antarctica used to have uh, seas across it. At times when the West Antarctic ice sheet was not there, at warmer times, uh, this was a marine basin. And this is where I, I come in with my science and that of Amy Leventer of looking at one-celled fossil algae called diatoms. A diatom is a single-celled algae, so it's photosynthetic, and that means that it can only live in the uppermost part of the water column, and so it's telling you things about the upper ocean. So there are two big things that the diatoms can tell us here. One is they can tell us something about the environment, so whether there was you know, different environmental conditions. The other thing they can tell us is they can tell us about the time that it happened. And so one of the big things we want to see here is when were marine waters extending beyond the grounding zone and this was an open seaway. The other thing that we can see is what's under the Antarctic ice and that should be eroding out from the bedrock and into our site. And there it is. You found the Simon Sinai? A piece of a Simon yeah. Sinai. Actually, I always called it Simon Sinai. I do consider the kind of science I do no different than an historian. And a history professor may look at ancient 
books, ancient archives, going back page by page. And I do that by going back from the topmost sediment, which was deposited yesterday, and then back through time. Each layer is older in time. I know I described myself as working with the diatoms that that's one language, but there are lots of other languages. And so in some ways we're like this big team that each of us speaks a different language and then we figure out the whole story. I feel like my contribution is helping us understand climate, deglaciation, how does the world work? and trying to provide enough information to convince people above me or in a different bracket that this is real. We're just, again, reading the history book and telling them this is how it works. The exploration that we're doing, it's that because there's a goal beyond ourselves. So we do have adventure when we're out there, but always above that adventure is the mission, which is the science. I think the most impressive things for me is we don't see each of us as individual scientists. We all have one big mission and this idea that the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. Uh, well, I think it might be worth noting that um, at a I was at AGU, the American Geophysical Union meeting, just now, um, yesterday, and um, I was speaking to one of the, Brad Rosenheim is in there, and they said they've just decided that they've count their latest science is that we believe that 10,000 years ago, um, where we were at Lake Mercer, it actually was um, an ocean, and um, he told me that the um, atmospheric carbon was actually at um, like half of what it is now, then, so. Um, it's not good news, but. Um, so uh, this film is gonna be premiering in January at the Explorers Club in um, New York at the Polar Film Festival, so that's exciting. Um, and then, you know, we'll be submitting it around elsewhere. We're also gonna be doing um, PBS uh, learning media modules through this, so uh, breaking this apart into sections, so actually this just went online um, two days ago, uh, officially made public, so um, so this is gonna be, this details the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and um, kind of what the study is in relation to that. Um, and so any teacher anywhere can download this for free, uh, which is a really wonderful resource, and I think that then crosses all kinds of educational barriers, um, which I really like. Um, and so that's why we're doing, we're gonna do about three more of these kind of things. Okay, uh, so I have a few measurable web results I wanted to show you, um, just that we reached um, since 2017, um, 83,000 views from 149 countries. Um, and um, out of the 195 that exist, I think that's a debatable number, the 195, anyway. Um, and then we also had uh, over 600,000 views of one of our short films. So none of these films, the other ones that I've been showing you have been made public. Although I think that the Traverse, the first one that uh, Billy did, actually had 45,000 views, right, on Vimeo. And anyway, we've got a bunch of followers and, and you should follow us too, Salsa Antarctica. <laughs> um, and you can see where our spike happened. That was um, despite our difficulties in the field, we still spiked um, with all of our our followers around when we were doing the coring and when we were in the field. 
Okay, so, um, let's see. Oh yeah, I'm doing, uh, we're doing this, um, this triptych, which I'm very excited about, um, at the Birch Aquarium. Um, be um, basically three screens on a large wall, uh, looping um, a film. So that's meant to represent that. Uh, so now I'd like to talk to you briefly about the uh, feature length film that we're working on, uh, aimed at a general audience um, for Netflix or um, PBS. So we have an agreement with KQED. I'm basically trying to figure out the best, um, the best platform for uh, the audience that we're going for. Um, but it's obviously a younger audience. Um, and the film itself is diving into more of the human aspect, whereas that Corning for Climate was more of a science film. This is um, then showing the science through um, the scientists as humans uh, that they are, and, um, and doing that through an immersive, uh, what we call verite perspective. So it's more of an observational style. Um, and it also incorporates a very visual aesthetic, so high production value, attention to the sound design, uh, which then immerses you in that space. And then as the film unfolds, the characters will reveal themselves and so does the science simultaneously. So I call it kind of an immersive science film, right? So one of the underlying themes of this film is the importance of collaboration among different groups of people and a move away from the individual towards the greater good of society. Uh, we, all, we know that people affiliate themselves with their beliefs in things like climate change according to their perceived culture um, or ideology. So one of the strengths, I think, of this film is that, um, it, that we do have uh, people from all over the United States, including, and we also have other countries represented. We have a variety of age groups with this, within the scientists themselves. Um, and we also have... Um, People who like like some of the drillers, some of them had been farmers. You know, some of that, that equipment is actually made by farmers and uh, train conductors. We've got um, one of them was one of the drillers' mother was a peng is a penguin biologist, and so there's a wide range of people that I think can maybe people can identify with. The science itself also touches um, on geology to biology to hydrology and geophysics, and all unified by this really large-scale drilling um, process with lots of big equipment and uh, all done, you know, without chemicals. So um, I'd say more than any other educational goal in this film, I want to invite the audiences to have a curiosity in science um, after watching. And so uh, we'll be getting an external, external evaluator to decide whether or not we were actually successful in that. So I'd like you now to be able to watch the trailer, so if you could turn your attention again to these screens, like um, you have been doing with my photos. But anyway, um, so if you could just take a look at the trailer. Um, it's about five minutes. Okay. Antarctica affects global climate, it affects oceanographic systems, but the most obvious way that affects everyone is through sea level rise. And when you have this much ice, when that ice melts, it will raise sea level. And that will matter to 
really the entire planet. We've been here for 20 or 21 days. This is uh, clothes that don't smell so bad. <laughs> and these are clothes that smell really bad. <laughs> so that, that, that one stays shut. I have a, a sleep mask. This helps because it's daylight all the time. We're not very far from the South Pole, and we're not very far from where Scott walked along. He walked along those mountains and then took a right turn south over there. Walking in this stuff for two months, pulling big sleds by your, you know, human power. Wow. Different kind of people, huh? Remind you how much of a lunatic Scott and those guys were. Yeah. Oh, just maybe up to here, so that then I can just quickly. I'm an ice driller by trade, one of the few people that make their living by drilling holes in ice in Antarctica for science projects. So this is how dairy farm stuff. Hey, when you hire farmers to build your trail, that's what you get. This is a bulk tank from a dairy farm? This is a new problem. We had a bunch of other problems. We knew nothing about this, this continent. Everyone thought it was this big, dead, benign block of ice. But in the last 20 years, and the work done with all these students that are my and people in my lab, it's, it's, it's all full of life. continent that's almost completely covered by ice and all that ice has the potential to melt and raise sea level, you certainly want to understand its history. And some of those clues are held in the lake sediments. Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking, remember it's upside down, so you have to stand on your head. Yeah. That's looking up the hole. But yeah, that's we're right at the lake interface. Yeah. That is way different than I pictured it. Okay, so this image from the Apollo 8 mission to the moon was taken by astronaut Bill Anders on Christmas Eve, 1968, and then turned into an animation by NASA. It's, uh, it's credited as um, helping to launch the environmental movement, um, and it's intrinsically a story of human curiosity um, and exploration. Though we can't all exactly know what Bill Anders felt that day, uh, the perspective this image gave us of looking at the Earth as a unified whole in a dark universe reframed the planet for our human eyes. Had he not been equipped with a camera that day, the very environmental movement likely wouldn't have had the same impact. So if we're going to improve environmental literacy, it will be through a healthy populace that cares about ecosystem science. But science alone can't help us. Whether it's equipping scientists with media tools or embedding film artists, the more ways we can reach students and teachers through their hearts and minds, the more quickly we can revise our environmental ethic. Environmental scholar Andrew Hoffman writes, we don't need to be told about the problem again. We need to know how we can understand it, how we can explain it to others, and how we can come to a collective acceptance of why it happened and how we can fashion a response. In this era of the Anthropocene, in preparing for the effects of climate change, we need to focus on developing healthy societies, reviving dialogues of civic living, and the awareness of our shared humanity. 
In effect, we need all the silos of our intellect to fire up together so we can reframe our environmental ethic for the future. Thanks, and try following us. I think I could probably take one question, and then I think um, we need to introduce the next. Anybody? Well, then I can just introduce the next person. OK, so please welcome uh, students from the CSU Channel Islands representing the performing arts, environmental science and resource management, political science, and English programs. <laughs> 